Hi everyone, today I want to talk about one of my favorite Haskell topics. This is something I love introducing new Haskellers to because it just blows their mind. And that is the true nature of I.O. in Haskell. Um, so, so the conversation often goes, uh, like you know, someone asks me, what, what is a monad anyway? Um, to which my answer always is, it, it's, a, it's a computation done in a context. Right? So the maybe monad, the context gives you the, the opportunity to fail. The either monad, uh, the context gives you the opportunity to sort of produce an exception. Um, and there's a state monad where the context allows you to store a state. There's a reader monad that allow, that the, where the context allows you to access some information. So all of these are just contexts in which a computation can happen. But then the question always is, well, what's I.O.? How does I.O. fit into that? How is, how is I.O. a context? So uh, the answer to that is actually we can look up what the type is of I.O. in, in GHC. So, so let's actually just go ahead and do that. Um, and so I'm going to search for it. I happen to know it's a new type. So new type I.O. Yeah, in Haskell files. Let's look in GHC, my, my latest checkout, GHC now in its libraries folder. OK, so, so this is doing a recursive grep for that. Oh, it found a few new type I.O. So let's take a look at that. So here it is. This is the definition of I/O, um, and and so what can we what can we do with that? And and so this this video will sort of explore some of the fun things that we can do. But let's let's look at what this is. So this is a new type. So it says that I/O_A is really the same thing as this type. Well, what is this? This is the state of the real world, and it returns a new state of the real world and some var value a. Um, so this, if you're not familiar with it, this notation is an unboxed tuple. Um, it's a small optimization, or maybe a big optimization, over a normal tuple. So we can just sort of forget the little hash mark if you want to, and that's a good um, idea of what it means. This state hash real world is not really represented by anything at runtime, but we can think of it as the real world. So in other words, an I.O. computation takes the state of the real world, right, the exact positions of every atom and electron, if atoms and electrons had exact positions, and velocities, of course, we can't know all that at the same time, but, but it takes that and then it produces a new real world one moment later with maybe some other value, right? So when I say put Sterlin, um, that, has, that has type IO string, or string to IO unit, rather. Um, so what that does is that's going to take this string and it takes the real world and moves the bits around, moves the electrons around so that you see a string on your screen. And that's the new real world that's returned to you. And then, of course, that real world can be fed into the next operation. And this is really its definition, right? So I want to keep this. Let me, can I do enough Emacs stuff? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, oh it's getting worse. It's getting worse. I want something like this. And then I want it again. So we have this definition here, and then we can play up here, and then this should be Haskell. OK, sorry about that, folks. Um, OK, so, so here we have, have this. Now, this is in the module ghc.types. So I can actually import ghc.types, including IO, and that actually works. So now we have access to the IO constructor. And, and so let's see what we can do. So, so first, let's just reconfirm that we can do basic things. So I can say put Sterlin of hello, and I can compile this and run it, and then we get hello. OK, so that's all well and good. Um, but now I said I have access to this constructor. So I can really use the constructor, um, and then now I can take in the real world. So I can take this real world, and, and then so this put Sterlin, so let's, let's remind ourselves, put Sterlin as type string to IO unit. So that means that this thing here is an IO unit. Well, an IO unit, I want to get this sort of real worldy thing out of it. So I could say case of, uh, let's reformat this a little bit. Um, I'll put that in there. Um, so, so we have case putsterlin hello of, and then I can get this, and it's going to be in the IO, this is going to be an IO thing. And what is it going to be? It's going to be some function. And then I can call fun on the real world. right? So this kind of makes sense. So this fun real world, right? what I need to have over here is a function from real world to tuple of state hash real world and unit. And that's what this fun will give me. So does this compile? Yes, it does. 
And if I run it, it actually works. Um, okay, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but, but what if I do other strange things? So what if instead of just case and then I run that function, what if I ignore it? Um, and then I see case put Sterlin goodbye here. Uh, and then this is the one that I run. Let's see, this is IO fun, fun real world. So this still compiles, this still is type correct. What happens when I run it? Now we just get goodbye. And in some sense, I've never forced, I've never forced this put Sterlin hello. But let's see what happens if I force it. So now we're going to need some sort of bang patterns, I think. So let's turn on bang patterns. And now what's going to happen? Now we still just get goodbye. This is all working out really well. Um, so but what if I say this is fun one, and we're not going to end up needing the bang, right? Because it's just a function here. Um, so the fact that whether or not I unpack it, it doesn't really matter, right? There's another video about that. So here I, I use put sterlin hello of, of io fun one. And this is, we'll call this fun two. And then I can say that this is fun two, but now I can case on fun two of real world to unpack real world prime. And then that's going to be unit. So that's kind of boring. And then I can call fun one on real world prime. Um, that should be typed correct. Oh, but we're going to need unbox tuples. Okay, that compiles. And now we get goodbye first and then hello. This makes sense because of the way I've threaded this. So we call fun2 on real world and then, um, and then we get real world prime and I call fun1 on real world prime. I wonder what would happen if I just call fun1 on real world though. Right, we're going to get some output here, but I'm going to ignore that. And instead, I'm going to call fun one on real world. So we could almost think of this as like, you know, I don't know if, you, if, if, if you've heard of sort of the, the, the multiple worlds uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. Right? We take the real world and we can pass it both to fun one and to fun two. And let's, let's see what happens here. And now I run. And now we get goodbye followed by hello. That's interesting because here it looks like I've run the fun two thing, the goodbye thing before the fun one thing. So it's actually not really passing the real world around. I can't duplicate the world. But the Haskell type system doesn't really know about that. So this also actually hooks into linear types a little bit, doesn't it? Because if we had linear types, then we could make sure that not to do this funny duplicative thing. Um, so, so that's kind of interesting. Um, what, what about this? What if I do fun one of real world and... Uh, and then I, what if I do that twice? How can I how can I get that to happen twice? Oh, um, I don't know. Can I do seek here? What will happen if I do this? I think this I will get a type error here. Right. So we can't do this. Right. We can't do this. But I can just use case again. Um, so we can use case of and then I don't really care what goes in here anymore because so I'm just going to call fun one on the real same old real world again. And then now here, when I run this, now we get hello twice because I'm calling this this fun one twice. Um, and so in some sense, yes, we can think of this as passing the real world around. But in the end, we actually have to implement this on a real machine, right? We can't really take the whole universe and pass it around. That's not something we can do. Um, but we can, um, we can sort of manufacture these real world tokens. So at runtime, real world here is represented by nothing at all. Right? These are zero bits flowing around. And so I can do all this stuff. There's no way that the runtime system can tell the difference between any of these real world because there's no data stored inside them. And so we can reorder these different um, uh, uh, IO actions in any way we want. But maybe some understanding of this can inform how, say, unsafe perform IO works. And it also, I think, helps conceptualize how IO is a monad just like any other. It's really just a state monad. It just so happens that the state is the real world. All of these shenanigans well, that's just some fun that we can have with that idea. Uh, but in the end, I think the payoff is that this idea of IO as a monad, this really fits in to this larger picture of how monads work. I hope this has been interesting for you. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.